I live in Thailand, but not as an English teacher, NGO worker, or a professional of any kind. I'm a local Thai, so if you're expecting some ladyboy joke from the title, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I feel like I should let you foreigners know about what I encountered last weekend. I know foreigners don't normally believe in the supernatural, but I believe this subreddit is different. People come here to listen to extraordinary accounts because it's true, right? So please listen to my story. This knowledge might save your life when you next visit Thailand. I lurk on Reddit because it entertains me to read about other parts of the world. I'm just an office worker living in the capital city of Bangkok, wearing a tie, working on Excel, always being scolded by my American boss. But my home is in the rural countryside, lots of green paddy fields and sugar palms in the distance with the backdrop of grey hills. I was raised there by my parents who are rice farmers. I used to bring the buffaloes to graze in the fields just so I could doze all day on its sturdy back. It is a place of my nostalgia. As an office worker, I try to visit my parents as often as I can because they're old now, much too old for farm work. But still, they wouldn't lay their hands. Imagine if you're 60 but have to hunch over the field under a scorching sun to plant the rice stalks all day from dawn to dusk. Anyway, I visit just so I can bring some joy to their hearts and hand them a little souvenir from the city. Usually, it's a little bit of money I can spare after paying for my rent, but when I am running short, I would buy them some American sweets or cookies that I'm pretty sure they've never tasted before. So it is this past weekend that things became strange and terrifying. I could barely believe it if it hadn't happened to myself. If my uncle or auntie from the village told me that they'd seen what I'd seen, I would nod politely and secretly deride them for their superstition. But now that it happened to myself, I don't know what to believe. Last Saturday, I planned to visit my parents early in the morning, but my boss told me that he needs his PowerPoint done by 3 p.m. Just perfect. It would take me five hours to travel from Bangkok to my hometown by train, and the last one leaves at 2 p.m. So I went into his office and worked like I never worked before. I skipped lunch and turned out the PowerPoint and immediately rushed to the train station. I barely made it in time to board the train. However, that means that I will have to walk to my parents' home when it's dark. And that makes me nervous. It is known that no one should walk around after dark in my village. Now before you criticize me, I'm not a superstitious man. I'm a city dweller, an office worker, a man of science. I'm more scared of physical threats like being mugged or murdered, even if it's unlikely to happen in the lonely, quiet track to my parents' house. The nervousness comes from my upbringing. In my village, and many others in Thailand, we believe in folk tales and ghosts. Instead of a doctor, my parents would bring me to a shaman whenever I'm ill. When I was suffering from the dengue fever at the 13th year of my life, the old crone of a shaman had crouched over me with her teeth stained black from beetle nuts, breathing over me with a sickly sweet stench. She then declared that I was plagued by a malevolent ghost who would soon kill me if it wasn't appeased. My parents immediately cooked up a feast and brought the offerings to pray before the local banyan tree, lighting candles and asking monks to perform a prayer service. They said that cured me and was the reason I am alive today. Of course, I don't believe them now. I know that dengue fever is caused by a virus transmitted by a mosquito. But still, once you are raised in that kind of belief, it is hard to shake it off. All throughout the slow trudging train journey, then the bus journey on the winding road through the darkening countryside. I couldn't find a comfortable seat. I kept fidgeting, shifting around, checking my phones over and over. I told my parents that I would arrive late and they told me that it might be better if I moved my visit to the next weekend. I then told them that I'm already on the train and they told me that it's better if I spend the night at the train station. I grunted and didn't reply. I was determined to make the journey that very night. I wanted to surprise them. I wanted to prove the village wrong. I was determined to visit them and prove that village belief was outdated to make a difference with my superior beliefs from the city. Looking back, I realize now that 
I was just using those excuses to calm my fears. Because when I got off the bus around 8 p.m. and saw the track leading through the paddy fields towards my parents' house, in the darkness, all my reasons became flimsy and fragile. We had streetlights only on the main road, but nothing on the minor trails. I felt a childhood fear tugging at my heart. Why didn't I listen to my parents, I thought. Without thinking, I picked up my phone and called them again, but there was no signal, not even a single bar. Usually I would get a 3G internet even when I'm out here. I blame the signal failure. We get plenty of those. Cicadas were chirping and insects began to gather around me, so I couldn't just stand out there to be a sitting blood bank. So gripping the talisman around my neck, I went off the dark trail that I would normally be so familiar of that would remind me of home. It didn't feel that way now. That was when I realized that I've never wandered out here before in my life. The one kilometer walk to my house never seemed so long before, and it felt like I was a little boy once more. The first trail was between two paddy fields, each locked in a low level of water to help rice grow, and the first 100 meters was easy enough because the street lamp still illuminated the way. But beyond that, I had to use the torchlight from my phone to light the path in front of me, just in case there were snakes or scorpions. A whistling wind blew across the farm and I shivered at the sound. I crept along through the narrow trail until I saw the shadow of three sugar palms on my right, near the halfway point. I sighed and made a little smile, beginning to feel foolish for being so afraid. Just as I was easing my grip on my talisman, the world was plunged into darkness. The street lamps were all extinguished. Power cuts were common in rural Thailand, but my heart froze, holding my breath in my chest. There was only my phone torch left in front of me, and the moon and stars that offered too little light from my city dweller's eyes. I looked around wildly, throwing my torchlight everywhere, and an old prayer chant came naturally to my lips. Then I remembered that there should be only two sugar palms instead of three. I shone my light there and found two trees. I heard a plop, a dipping sound into the paddy field behind me, and spun around. I saw two long stalks of legs. I looked up to a pale, naked, emaciated body and arms as thin as chopsticks. I couldn't scream. My prayer stiffened on my lips and I fell into the muddy paddy field. I trapped my phone. It leaned down, long spidery legs folding, and the face came into the beam of my phone torchlight. Its eyes were pale like the blind, it had wispy hair, and its horrible, horrible mouth had shrunken into a tiny round hole smaller than my finger. It wheezed air through the hole in a shrill whistle and seemed to speak. When I couldn't reply, huddled in trembling silence, it whistled again, more shrilly, a tortured tone, and brought up two white hands as big as palm fronds. To make a Y gesture, putting hands together in a prayer that we Thai people are famous for. The sign meant greeting, thanking, or begging. I knew what it wanted. An old folklore was drilled deeper into me than the constructs of modern-day society, but I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even control my bladder or utter a prayer. Its expression changed, and the pale eyes grew bloodshot and the whistling suddenly stopped. Out of the hole of its mouth, a long red tongue rolled out and never seemed to end, until it was as long as my arm, then even longer. Bile rose to my throat and I wanted to vomit, but that physical bodily reaction woke me up from my paralysis and I finally screamed. I nodded furiously, I put my hands together to why it returned and words came blurting out of my soul. I promised it a feast. I told that it would never starve again. I swore that monks would bless its soul so it would suffer no longer. The tongue stopped extending, and then finally retracted. Its hollow eyes met me for a moment, and finally stood up on those spindly legs and swayed off into the darkness. The plopping faded away, and it was gone. I stayed where I was, soaked among the rice stalks. I didn't know how long I stayed there, but when the street lamps finally came back, I scrambled back to my feet, grabbed my phone, and sprinted to my parents' home. According to myth, what I had seen was a lost soul. 
It would roam the spirit lands, forever hungry because its mouth was too small to eat anything. So on Sunday, I immediately went to the temple to pray to alleviate its suffering and bought noodles as offerings placed before the two sugar palm trees near my parents' home. The noodles should fit in its tiny mouth. I'm back in Bangkok now, and I begin to wonder what would happen if I didn't know of the ghost or couldn't remember the village's teachings. It would have killed me, there's no doubt, to drain my blood, open my guts, and suck my intestines. So here's my warning to you, traveling foreigners coming to Thailand. I know you would like to travel to rural parts of Thailand for an exotic cultural experience, but please, remember that these are obscure areas cut off from the wider world. Whenever you happen to meet a ghost, pray for it and give it offerings. Be more open-minded and don't wear your rationality as a token of pride. There are many things that you don't understand in this world beyond the scope of cold, hard science. Don't be arrogant. Listen to villagers and respect their ways because superstition might save your life like it has saved mine. I've never told anyone the full story. The meals they gave us at the camp were basic. I mean, really basic. It was rice every day, which would have been cooked at the start of the week and left in a big metallic bin, accompanied by some sort of boiled chicken or tofu. I wouldn't complain, though. It was all part of the volunteering experience, I reckoned. Everyone called her P, but I never really knew her real name. She would warn us before every meal. Don't feed the dogs. That's food for you, not them. Some scraggly mutts would appear shortly after we sat on those rigid wooden benches, all big-eyed and sad-faced. I'm not really an animal person, but I have to admit, they melted my heart. If P saw us so much as to think about sneaking them a bit of chicken, all hell would break loose. Don't! No! No! Please, you can't! She'd scream. I never saw the harm in it, just some hungry dogs looking for a few scraps. New starts would come and the old stays would leave on a pretty regular basis, a conveyor belt of young idealists. One of them, a Turkish girl who spoke very little English, ended up breaking P's rule on her first day, and I finally understood. I'd never encountered many feral dogs before that. I mean, not like those wild things. As soon as that girl lowered her hand with that bit of chicken, they were all on her, biting, clawing, and ripping each other apart to get at it. The girl escaped with minor cuts, but those dogs turned on each other. In a flash, they went from cute and smiley to vicious and gnarling. It took me a while to understand it. I was so naive and I'd never seen that much desperation. Thailand is beautiful. The more northern rural parts I was in were surrounded by lush greenery and rolling hills. I was there for three months in the summer of 2011. I had just finished a stint in university and wanted to get away and see a bit of the world before I had to embrace the world of work. I found that organization online. It was pretty popular with UK students as well as Americans and Australians. We'd go live in huts and volunteer our time by helping the locals build houses and storage sheds. Then for a few days, the more experienced volunteers would hike into the mountains and go help the rural villages. I mean really rural. Hours from the nearest accessible road and with only one small generator which gave the villagers enough electricity to power one light bulb each for a few hours a night. It was the bamboo floors that I will always remember, uneven and painful to sleep on, but we never had a choice. The villagers would let us stay in their houses to sleep, with them bunking up with their neighbors temporarily. Then during the day, we'd help out with the field work. The entire village was made up of maybe 20 to 25 houses, a couple of sheds and a building which looked like some sort of village hall. There were ten of us volunteers, and P came to help translate for us. The first night we were there, an elderly woman invited us all into her house, and we all sat around a huge walk while she cooked up pad thai. It was easily the best one I ate during my whole time in the country. We are so happy to have you come, P translated as she spoke. Big, strong men and women to help with the field work. She gestured to a large area of uneven grass and shrubbery behind the rickety bamboo house. We all nodded and smiled. 
I think we were all thinking about how grateful we were for the things we all took for granted back home. The young men and women all leave. P began to translate for a frail old man who I presumed was the woman's husband. Well, what does he mean by that? I asked P. She smiled knowingly. Once they're old enough, the boys and girls all leave for Chiang Mai or Bangkok to make money or study. Many of them never come back. There's not anything here for them. It hit me that I hadn't seen any villager remotely near my age that whole day. It was all elderly folks and young children. I could empathize with the ones that left, though. I mean, once you'd been to the city and experienced all it had to offer, there really was no coming back to that little mountain village. I smiled politely as the old man spoke, and tears welled up in his eyes a little. P told us that he had two sons and three daughters, all of whom had left as soon as they were able to find work in the city. They would send a little bit of money back up occasionally, maybe visit every few years, but they wanted nothing to do with the village. That's why you are needed here," P said before standing and bidding us a good night. The other volunteers seemed happy enough to be there. But I had this lingering feeling that something wasn't right. I couldn't qualify it, but it was something about the way P looked while he spoke to her in Thai, like he was telling her more than what she told us. What if one of the villagers hurt themselves or get sick? Where's the nearest hospital? One of the Americans asked. The old man started chuckling at this, obviously understanding the word hospital and what that guy was asking. He gestured to P and spoke a few words. Nearest hospital is seven hours away if you have a car. No one in the village has car though; they don't go to hospital. P laughed, but it never made me feel too secure. The old man had continued to chuckle and mumble to P, pointing to a shelf behind us. Villagers use old medicine anyway, tea and herbs that cure any sickness. We all kind of looked at each other, trying to mask our skepticism. But who were we to judge? The next day, we were out toiling on the fields. Our job was fairly simple: strip away all the shrubbery and rocks, and flatten out the patch of land and square off. Then we had to dig these little trenches, which were a few feet long and the same deep, so that the villagers could plant their seeds. We had primitive-looking tools to do this, though: rickety hoes with broken handles and a couple of spades. We were happy, though. The villagers needed this patch to grow rice and. We were the only ones that were fit enough to do it under that baking hot sunshine. The kids from the village would watch us and giggle as we worked. We must have been the first non-Thai people they had ever seen in the flesh. The group was pretty diverse too, like some front page of a university syllabus. There was a couple of Indian guys, a few black guys, a Mexican girl, and a few white guys and girls. It must have been weird for all the kids, I suppose. For all of the giggling kids, though, there were a few glum faces that stared out at us, probably a little frightened, I guess. They always kept their distance too, never venturing any closer than twenty feet from us. They put it down to their fear at the start, but noticed that whenever any of the kids got closer to us, their guardians would scream at them in a harsh tone. I came to the conclusion that it was the older ones who were actually afraid of us for some reason. We hadn't really met anyone besides from the old man and woman who were feeding us. Everyone I met in Thailand during my entire visit had been cheerful and happy to see us there, but the people in that village, there was this weird kind of solemn mood that hung over the place, which made me feel a little uneasy. I shouldn't have wandered that night. I mean, they never specifically told us not to, but I think P kind of suggested that we just. Stay in our dorms after dark. I liked most of the people in my group, but spending days in such close quarters with anyone will eventually drive you a bit insane. So I stepped out for a little bit of air and looked at the stars, which were beautiful, by the way. Something about the crisp mountain air and lack of any sort of pollution that seemed to amplify the night sky. I was standing there, gulping upwards, when I heard the noise. It was like a groan, but a little more high pitched. I spun my head around, expecting to see some sort of animal, maybe a dog or a cat, but nothing was there. The groaning grew louder as I navigated the muddy lanes, looking for its source. Eventually, I found myself standing a few yards from the town hall building. 
Whatever was making that noise was coming from inside there, an agonizing groan and heaving. What the hell? I muttered to myself, edging closer cautiously. The ground was made up of loose mud and rocks, so I was careful not to make too much noise or lose my footing. The sound of twisted gurgling began to fill my ears as I reached for the bamboo shutter. I had to see what was in there making all those inhuman noises. A sharp tug on my arm spun me around and I was face to face with the elderly woman who fed us, grinning from ear to ear as she spoke. No, 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 only us, gesturing towards the building. That noise. I gestured to my ear, pleading with her to tell me what the hell was going on. She just kept smiling and tugging at my arm, pulling me away from the building. I didn't want to get into a wrestling match with an elderly Thai woman, so I went with the flow, but never taking my eyes off of that little building. No, no, no. Only us. Not you there. She kept on repeating and smiling at me. P met us as we neared the house I was sleeping in, yelling something in Thai at that woman. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just there's something in that building over there. I stammered with pleading eyes towards P who in turn began motioning to the elderly woman. After a brief exchange, P took my arm from the woman and continued with the process of dragging me away. I told you, no wandering at night, please. Go back to house. What was that? What did she say? Not important. It's only important that you stay away from there. Please respect the privacy. I have to admit, I did feel like a bit of a jerk when she said that. I mean, sure, it was freaky and it did shake me up, but at the end of the day, it probably looked like some obnoxious foreigner barging in and demanding to know what was going on. As it turned out, that was going to be our last night there anyway. To this day, I swear I could hear that groaning and hissing noise from the house where I was sleeping, although I never actually slept a wink that night. It was one of those things that shakes you. You know it's not right, but you just can't figure out why. Now I know, though. It's a lot worse than I could have ever imagined. I hadn't noticed the little girl approaching us while we dug. I don't think anyone did. She must have been about four, maybe a little older, and was kind of frail looking. She wore a friendly smile on her face, then tugged at the sleeves of one of the American girls in our group, then presented her with a blue flower. Aw, thank you, sweetie. Isn't that just beautiful? The girl from my group dropped to one knee and gave the little girl a squeeze. She giggled and placed her arms around the American's neck. It was a beautiful scene. I remember thinking about the differences in our cultures and privileges as I watched these two worlds meet in a warm embrace. A shrill shriek pierced through the air and my perception faded quickly. My spade hit the mud as I twitched, startled by an approaching sound. It was a woman, one of the villagers, running towards us at full speed and screaming at the top of her lungs. Before any of us could react, she was over the American girl, and with one swift motion of surprising strength, she threw her backwards. The deranged-looking woman began barking at us unintelligibly and pointing at the chalk-faced American on the ground. The little girl had taken off in fits of tears as she approached us slowly. I remember how red and swollen her eyes looked, and the contorted look of pain on her face, I had never seen anything like that before. She edged closer and closer, the American girl on the ground now scrambling back towards the group and screaming at the woman to back off. P's shouts filtered through the air and we all turned to face her as she ran towards us, waving her arms. She grabbed the woman by the arm and dragged her back. The woman was a mess of tears and hollows by that point. P calmed her down eventually and she fell down to the ground with a weary thud. The other villagers had formed a line on top of the hill staring at us motionlessly as the situation unfolded. It was unsettling, to say the least. Get your belongings. We go right now. P barked at us, and we all obliged without a second thought, dropping our tools and hurriedly moving back to the houses. The villagers parted like the Red Sea as we approached the hill, falling back from us with a look of fear in their eyes. What the hell is going on? I heard someone say as we packed and followed P back to the mountain pass. It was still a good few hours hike until we could reach the road, but no one spoke the whole way. We just marched silently throughout the hillside, 
trying to get back before nightfall. Now I've told a few people this, but it's not the whole story. The bit I always miss out is the bit I've never mentioned to anyone, not even the others in my group. It was as we left, trudging up the steep hill to the mountain pass, that I realized I left my phone at the ridge where we'd taken a rest. It was about a 10 minute jog back, and the atmosphere among the group was so strange that I decided to slip away silently, then catch up with them. When I reached the ridge, I quickly located my iPhone, and then turned to meet with the group again, when something caught my attention. I realized from a few meters to the west of the ridge, there was a point where I could see over the entire village, like a perfect vantage point. My curiosity got the better of me, and I peered down that steep incline to the place where we'd spent the last few days. The villagers had formed a line, almost. They were all standing in a straight line from that village hall building, spread out all the way to the garden we had worked on. Then I noticed the boxes, wooden crates that were silently passing from one person to the next, all the way to the garden. That feeling of naivety and horror washed over me again. The penny had finally dropped. None of us had realized what we were actually doing. The patch of land we had leveled, the trenches we had dug, we had been digging graves, small graves. I watched on with a sickening feeling in my stomach as they lowered the little boxes into the holes. By the time I had caught up with the group, they realized I was missing, and P wore a furious expression which faded away when she saw my chalk white face. In that moment, she realized what I had seen and I realized that she'd known all along. She broke eye contact with me and yelled something about hurrying up before nightfall. I'm not entirely sure I believe in ghosts, to be honest. Even after all of this happened, I'm still a little skeptical about ghosts and hauntings, though I'll bite on some of the other paranormal things that go down in the woods or the mountains at night. Of course, this changes my mind a little. For a little background, I'm half Thai, half American. My mother is full-blooded Thai and had lived there for most of her life. She moved to the US after I was born in Bangkok. Every two years or so, my sister, my mother, and I fly to Thailand to see my cousins, aunts, and uncles, and my grandparents. They're fairly poor, so they can't afford a plane ticket to see us in America. And besides, it's a nice vacation for my sister and I so we can get away from my rigorous academic lives and meet family again. In 2012, we flew down to Bangkok and drove to Ayutthaya, another older city, to get to our bed and breakfast sitting at the Chao Praia River. My mother had chosen it specifically because it wasn't too expensive, and it had a beautiful view of the oldest Buddhist temple in Thailand, which was just across the river. I would have thought she had known better. By the time we got to the bed and breakfast, it was late at night. Someone had taken my luggage on accident, so... We were all laughing about how confused they were going to be, opening a suitcase full of books and expensive bras. We'd just been on a plane for over 24 hours, driven for another two, and all of us were exhausted. There were only two beds, so my sister crashed on one, and my mother and I crashed on the other. By then, it was almost four in the morning. That night, I had a strange experience. I'm not sure how to describe it, I knew that I was still asleep, my body was still and my mother was next to me, and it was still nighttime. Yet I could feel myself being dragged out of my body. It was like someone had gripped me by the feet and was trying to pull me out of bed while leaving my flesh behind. I remember fighting against it, trying to stay in my body for what seemed like a long time. It was a little scary, as if someone had reached inside and was repeatedly yanking me away. The room was lit with a weird yellow glow from the street lamp. Things seemed bright and harsh in my memory, but I couldn't see what it was that grabbed me. I remember watching my hip pass my line of sight before I was suddenly released and I fell back asleep. The next morning, I thought nothing of it. I get sleep paralysis frequently, but this was different. 
In sleep paralysis, I had always tried to move but couldn't. This was the exact opposite. I was trying to stay still and something else was trying to move me. For whatever reason, it didn't bother me much. I dismissed it. I went down to the riverside and had breakfast, sat on a deck and called my boyfriend, decided to take it easy and forget about it. Then my mom came downstairs and sat on the riverside with me. The two of us had a short conversation. I can't remember what it was about. Somehow, we got on the subject of the temple. It was old, dating back to the 1300s. They say that ghosts like to hang around temples a lot. Most people don't like to sleep around temples at night, my mother told me. Especially old temples. Very spooky. At the time, it seemed just like another footnote. My mother was chock full of information about the cities around Bangkok and Korat, where she lived. Still, it stuck with me for a while, thinking of the temple across the river, with its high walls and its ancient history as a place where all the dead of the old capital were taken to be buried after Burma burned the city to ashes. For the next couple of nights, things went on as normal. We went sightseeing, visited tourist spots, and rode on a ferry with some old friends of ours. Then, one day, my mother asked me while we were alone, do you remember that first night at the bed and breakfast? Of course I do, I said. I still vividly remembered being yanked out of my body. It's not an experience you easily forget. It was so strange that first night. I had a horrible dream that night, that there were two young men in our room. They were digging through all of our things and looking at us. I could feel that they were dangerous, she said quietly. I frowned and listened. I remember trying to protect you and your sister. I wanted them to leave. In my dream, I couldn't move, so I prayed to Jesus, asking for help that they would leave us alone. My mom told me. She was a recent convert to Christianity, having been a Buddhist most of her life, and I converted that very summer as well. Yet, it had never crossed my mind to pray while I was attacked. My mother was a very spiritual person, and she was incredibly open to the supernatural. I was less inclined. Still, I was curious. Did they leave? I asked. After you prayed? My mother nodded, and that was the end of that. I thought on it, trying to assess the validity of her dream. While I was a Christian, I was also studying to be a scientist. After all, it could have just been a dream. Yet the fact that she had felt spiritually attacked the same night I had also felt spiritually attacked while sleeping near a Thai temple after being so mentally exhausted seemed an odd kind of coincidence to me. Especially after experiencing the sudden release from whatever it was that had attacked me in my sleep. Thai folklore is full of ghosts and perhaps that was what my mother drew upon. Perhaps I just dreamt the whole thing up. Perhaps becoming a new convert to religion had left me open to spiritual ideas and fears. Either way, while that was my first time encountering ghosts in Thailand, it wasn't the last. I haven't asked my sister if she ever dreamt of anything. Perhaps one day, I will. Hey guys, I got a nice story that might perk your interest. When I was in grade 9, I went to school in Hong Kong. For our annual trip, we went over to Thailand to some rural little campground with dorms. Every year, my school went to this particular camp because it was conveniently located for the activities that the school annually planned. However, those students in higher grades always said that the dorm 4D was haunted. As luck would have it, I was assigned to dorm 4D with seven other classmates. When we arrived on the first day, everything was pretty fine. We did some hiking, rock climbing, your standard outdoor camp activities. During our free time period, I was pretty worn out. I'm not much of a physically active person, so I decided to head back to my dorm and finish off my Harry Potter books, when suddenly, in the corner of my eye, I could swear that I saw someone peering through the window of the dorm. As soon as I glanced up though, the figure vanished. However, the shrubs just outside the window were still slightly rustling, almost like who or whatever it was had just taken off. I disregarded it as someone who was just being overly curious 
so I continued reading my books. After us kids had dinner, we all headed back to our dorms and started fooling around. We were sitting in the common area, playing cards and all. It was getting rather late, I'd say around 11pm by now, so it was past curfew time. Teachers were going around to check that people were in their dorms, and it was lights out at 12am. As we were playing cards, all of us thought that we could hear someone faintly humming, a high-pitched voice, like a kid's voice coming from the bathroom. If you've ever tried talking aloud in a bathroom, you know that your voice sort of echoes. Well, the humming had that kind of effect, so we thought that it was coming from the bathroom. I went to check the bathroom, but there was nothing there. As soon as I came within, say, 15 feet of the door, the voice stopped. Freaky, I thought. But as we were all in a big group of eight, we weren't all that worried. So after lights out, we were all pretty much burnt out. We decided to turn in, and this is when things really started to go down. It was going on to about 12.45 when I heard a startled yell coming from the other bedroom. I rushed out to the door with Andrew, my bunkmate, and we bumped into all the other guys in the dorm. They were all peeping out of their rooms at the same time. The guys in room 2 were looking really panicked. We asked them what was wrong, and Steve, one of the dudes, said that he saw a figure in a long red gown walk briskly past the open doorway as he was lying there in the dark trying to go to sleep. Obviously, we found no such figure in the room. Now, Steve was a big, athletic guy, around 6'2 at the time of the incident. He was always the hard ass when it came to sports, and really outgoing. It was pretty freaky for him to be the one getting scared like that so we were all pretty unsettled. Coming around 2 a.m., we were all suddenly startled again, and once more ran out and met in the common area. It seemed like there was maniacal laughter coming from the corridor outside, and there was a clanging too, like someone holding something metallic and banging it against the walls. The noise seemed to be coming closer to our door, louder and louder, until it suddenly stopped. By this time, we were ready to bail, and pretty scared. We all decided to pull up our bedsheets, clear the living area, and the camp as a whole group in the middle of the dorm. It wasn't until 4 a.m. that the weird things went down again. We all had pretty much passed out by this point, but we were awoken by a strange thumping sound that seemed to come from the roof. It was almost as if someone was walking on the roof, because the thumps went from above my room to above the second room and down to the third and then the fourth rooms. We decided to head outside to see if there was anything on the roof. Grabbing our flashlights and phones, we went out as a group. First, we checked the roof. Nothing. We went around to check if there was anything that could leap up to the roof that someone could climb. We found a large drain pipe that was running alongside the window where I thought I saw the figure. However, it didn't really have enough foothold for anyone to climb. I did notice something strange though. The window where I thought I saw the figure was really, really dirty. There was also a strange set of five lines, almost as if someone had dragged their hand down the window, displacing some of the dirt. Also, the drain pipe had caused the ground around the window to become fairly damp and muddy. Anyone who had been there would have left prints or marks of some sort. I did not see any prints other than my own, which struck me as strange. We decided to head back to our room and tell the teachers about it when we next saw them. However, when we got there, we saw the most freaky thing of all. All of our bed sheets that we had removed and gathered in the middle of the room had been pulled towards the bathroom. It seemed as if they had been pulled halfway through the bathroom door. Then the door had been closed on the sheets leaving them caught in the door. Freaked out beyond belief by this point, we decided to take overnight shifts between the eight of us as we had to burn more hours until 8 a.m. when we could head out for breakfast. This we did, and for the rest of the night, things seemed fine. The next day, we met the teachers in the cafeteria and we told them of what happened the night before. The teachers listened patiently, understanding from the seriousness of our faces 
that we were not kidding around. One of the teachers, Mr. Benton, said that he heard faint banging and stomping sounds coming from the direction of our dorm. Another, Mrs. Westwood, said that she thought several times in the night that a figure was walking outside her window. It was agreed that we would all move to a different location, and later on that day, we boarded a bus to go to a different campsite. Before leaving, Steve and I went to talk to the caretaker of the campground and asked him about the peculiar events. What he told us freaked us out big time. He said that one day, a little girl had been playing around, and she saw the big drain pipe leading up to the roof. She climbed the drain pipe and got up on the roof. The roof, however, was slanted and wet from the rain and humidity. She slipped, fell, and broke her neck, landing right outside the window where I thought I saw the figure. Her mother, one of the maintenance staff at the time, was so distressed that she went near insane, locking herself in the bathroom and humming incoherently for a whole day. Then, around 3 a.m. the same night, she ran, laughing hysterically throughout the corridor, climbed to the roof up the same pipe, and jumped, killing herself in the process. That's the first and hopefully last time I go to Thailand. My father was somewhat a skeptic in the paranormal. However, one of the few stories my dad would share about his childhood, this one was pretty in-depth. He was born in Cambodia, and around 14 is when he experienced what a war is like. The Khmer Rouge, as described by my grandmother and parents, were ruthless. Often, families would get separated, and because of that, my father's parents knew they had to get my father far from what was going to happen. As they were rudely awakened by Khmer Rogue trying to get into the house, my father could hear his parents constantly shouting at him to run so that he wouldn't have to see what was going to happen if he stuck around any longer. My dad told me that this was the hardest part he ever had to do in his life, but he did it. He ran from the thickest forest of Cambodia to make his way to Thailand. At the halfway mark between Cambodia and Thailand, a few monks spotted my dad and asked him where he was going by himself at this time of night. My dad, who understood Thai, told them about his situation, so they decided to walk with my dad where they would feed him and take him in. As you can imagine, the forest is pretty thick and the sound of gunfire is echoing throughout. The monks would stop at times to pray because dead bodies would be found, and my father would freak out by the sight of it, just like any kid would. As moments seemed like forever, the sun barely breaking through, my father heard a faint female voice in this pitch black forest. He looked up at the monks and noticed they started to chant and pray because they heard it too. My father decided to stand in between the monks if anything happened. This is what my father had a hard time explaining to us. As the monks chanted and prayed, they noticed that there was movements coming above them. The trees started to shake and my father told me he saw what he believed was a lady with super long hair, like the grudge-looking lady. The monks decided to continue chanting, and they told my dad not to look at her or pay any attention to her. They told him to chant and pray with them, so he did as so, and they started to chant louder and louder, and the trees around them started to shake. At this moment, the monks told my dad to make a dash for it because the border of Thailand was just up ahead. As he was running the entire time, he said that something was chasing him. He felt like something was nearly at his back but was far out of reach. He numbed out the pain from his feet and continued running. It felt like an eternity, but he eventually spotted some sunlight and pushed through the last few steps out of the forest. Whatever that was chasing him stopped and my father decided to turn around. He spotted the monks coming out and he said that they looked like they were fighting someone or something. My dad asked the monks if they saw what he saw. They said yes, and they thought having him run ahead would keep whatever it was away. But they said once my dad took off running, that thing was chasing him the entire time. This was one of the few stories that my father told me that pushed me from being a skeptic to somewhat a believer. My friends and I had been backpacking through Asia for a couple of months before moving back to the States. 
Towards the end of our trip, we stopped at Phuket, Thailand and checked into an Airbnb. I was dead asleep when I woke up to my friend clutching my arm tightly with a look of pure terror on her face. As I looked at her, completely confused as to why she was terrified, she said, Do you see it? And shakily pointed to the corner of the room on her side of the bed. I looked up and saw this large figure moving and expanding and collapsing itself at the same time. It felt like as if the energy was being sucked from the room. It appeared to have a mixture of black and glowing metallic red. It did not resemble a human at all. My brain really couldn't even fully comprehend what I was seeing. So naturally I responded to my friend by shakily pointing to the corner as well and responding, yeah, it's growing. The really weird part is that the last thing I remember was pointing, feeling scared, and then I woke up in the morning. I fell asleep, but it's more like I just blacked out. The next day, we didn't even discuss it. We said that it was strange and moved on. Recently, years later, we compared notes about what we had seen and experienced. Our notes aligned in every way, what we saw, passing out, how we felt. It's one of the strangest things that has ever happened to me and I could never really think of an explanation as to what we experienced. I got a text from a blocked number titled, A Gift from My Neighbor. It appears to be excerpts from a religious woman's diary. I thought the site would be the best place to post it. I found the photo online and it sort of matched the woman's description. These ghost amulet dolls come from Thailand and are the results of taking the ashes and oils of a dead infant or fetus. I won't go into specifics, but you can visit the site posted under my sources. Entry 23 Today after church, during fellowship, a conversation with Adam, my neighbor, escalated into a strange conversation about ghosts. I told him to bring it up to the preacher as I wasn't familiar or interested with the paranormal. I did notice he had slurred speech and dark circles under his eyes, apparently from many restless nights. That's when he snapped at me. I thought I could at least trust my own damn neighbor. You're such a hypocrite. What did our Lord say? Oh yeah, love thy neighbor. That means you at least hear a guy out. It was about that time that Deacon Peter and Pastor Michael ushered him and myself from the banquet hall, telling us that talk of ghosts was disturbing the flock. Needless to say, I was startled by this outburst and offended that my own pastor would assume I had instigated such a blasphemous conversation. Entry 24 Adam, I suppose, has not forgotten about yesterday, he was staring at my house for two hours from his window last night and tonight as well. I suppose that I should ask him what's on his mind some day. Entry 25 Something extremely strange happened today. So strange, in fact, that I feel the need to recount most of what has transpired for future reference. I came home from work and found an odd and admittedly freaky looking doll thing on my doorstep. Upon picking it up, I noticed it was greasy and had a pungent odor of burnt hair about it. What appeared to be human hair was protruding from what looked like its head. My first impression was that it was a voodoo doll. As I picked it up, I sensed someone or something watching me. As I looked around, I caught a glimpse of the curtain and the window of my neighbor's house moving. The same window he was staring out every night since our quarrel at the church. As a Christian, I'm not concerned with the paranormal. I know that Jesus is on my side, and that's all the paranormal I need in my life. I couldn't let this man disrupt the peace of my home with his intruding gaze and these newly developing mystical shenanigans. I took the doll to his house and rang the doorbell. After waiting what seemed like forever, he answered with a cold smile. Well, howdy, neighbor. I see you got my message, he said boisterously. I was curious. And just what message is that? He had a blank look on his sunken face. If God loves me so much, why won't he answer my prayers? 
I responded with disdain. Why was he evading the main issue at hand? I responded with, What prayers will the Lord not provide for with an answer or sign? His false grin disappeared. That's just the thing. I have too many answers. Come on inside while I explain. I was cautious at first, noting how unkempt his house seemed and how disgusting the interior of his house must be. After I crossed the threshold and my eyes adjusted to the darker ambience, I noticed a sparsely decorated and extremely clean living room with a leather reclining chair by a psychologist's hypnosis sofa. The only other furnishing I noticed was a display case filled with what I assumed was memorabilia from his service days. I paused in front of the display and noticed that among the medals and pictures, there was an empty box. I leaned in to inspect it, and upon closer inspection, I noticed a shipping label with his address as the return and delivery address. He had a seat in the leather recliner, leaving me in the hypnosis subject sofa. I sat upright so as not to be susceptible to anything suspicious. I saw you noticed my display case, he said. Yes, I didn't know you were so decorated. He smiled and said, All that four tours of Nam did for me was add weight to my chest, darling. I was wondering why he had been staring at my home and presented my issue delicately. I noticed you staring at my home from your window last night. Is there something that interests you? He wasn't affected by my question in the least. Mm, nothing interesting, just the same night every night. I couldn't help but ignore his blatant indifference to my concerns, but out of politeness I changed the topic. I then asked him what he meant by saying he had too many answers. He was obviously brewing something behind his baggy, listless eyes. What I meant is that, when I pray for all the answers, the answers to all I've done, all the judgments to just leave me alone, they never do. I... I am sick of them tearing away at me, and there's not much left to tear at. The only thing that keeps me going is that the fate I face if I just end it is way worse than sleep deprivation. I thought maybe you might be someone that could help a neighbor out, like a good Christian. How can I help? I asked, wondering how I might help a depressed veteran struggling with suicidal thoughts. You're serious? He asked with a look of bewilderment. Yeah, just tell me what I can do to help you sleep at night. And please remember that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem and therefore a sin. I was admittedly skeptical about how effective any help I could give would be to someone with a mental disorder. Well, all right, sister. You know that doll you found on your doorstep? Yeah, well, if you could take it off my hands, I might actually get some shut-eye and not spend my every waking second contemplating giving up on everything. Anything, dear? I wondered how taking this freaky thing could possibly help him get some sleep, but I'm sure it's a small price to pay for a contented life. I agreed to take the thing off his hands, and I saw a sudden glimmer of life in his eyes. He hastily fished a pen out of his pocket and wrote something on the box. My address. He handed the box to me, ushered me out of his house, and slammed the door. I had not noticed how late it had become while I was talking with him. Three hours passed by in what seemed like thirty minutes. As I walked home, I noticed the box in which I put the doll in began to get ice cold. Every step I took was arduous, and every breath was exhausting. Sensing something was wrong, I decided to knock on Adam's door to ask more about the box. I struggled to knock on the door, and as I was about to yell for him, I heard a muffled gunshot come from inside. I opened the door as quickly as I could. The once clean interior was a mess of dust, the floorboards rickety, there was no furniture, and on one of the floor, ceiling, and one of the walls was a brownish-red stain. 
No one had inhabited this home in years. Startled, I resisted the overwhelming urge to run and investigate. As I was scanning the room, I stepped through a floorboard. I struggled to pull myself out, but as my leg pulled from the crevice, I saw a glimmer of something metallic under the floorboard. I picked out of the dark what appeared to be military dog tags, and on one of the plates I read the name Adam Romberg. I don't know if I was guided by God or my neighbor's ghost, but everything slowed down as I quickly processed what had transpired. I had begun to second-guess everything I had been taught by the church. I crawled from the hole, abandoning the box, and struggled to get home. I feel like what happened was possibly a miracle, and I may have been sent by God to set a weary soul free. When I got to my doorstep, I noticed something that froze the blood in my veins. The box I thought I had abandoned at my neighbor's was sitting on my stoop. I am a good Christian woman, and whatever this madness is that I have been subjected to, I surely didn't deserve. The agents of Satan must be put to an end. I must cleanse this doll of its evil. After rubbing blessed oil on the doll and box, I will sleep easily knowing I have thwarted Satan. Entry 26 I am stuck here in bed, the very image of sloth. The whispering and scratching kept me up all night. Tubman can't get in. I can only hear him scratching, scratching at the windows and the door, meowing incessantly. All attempts to reach out to my preacher and neighbors are silenced. There's no phone service at my home. Instead of a dial tone, I hear blood-curdling screams and maniacal laughter. What was once my home has become my prison, and I suspect this satanic little doll is the warden holding me. I'm sure the Lord will embrace me and put this all to an end. This frail human body will die of thirst before my spirit is broken. Entry 27 Why won't it leave my bedside? Entry equals No Now here, where? And that was it. That was the story, guys. It was it was okay, I guess. Thanks. This story takes place one summer in Bangkok, Thailand, about three weeks after I had arrived as a participant in an international exchange program. It was ultimately about respect for other cultures, and some lessons you only learn the hard way. My name is Anna. And along with 19 others from all over Southeast Asia, I was enrolled in a university right beside the Chao Priya River. But it was the week of the Buddhist New Year, or Songkran, so no classes were being held. Most of the students living in our dormitory had gone back to their respective provinces for the holidays. At 20 minutes past midnight, when my Indonesian friend, Widya, had already fallen asleep, I heard frantic knocking on our door. I was already lying down on my bed and it was relatively late, so I was mildly annoyed. I thought it was one of the other girls on the floor. Perhaps they had run out of toothpaste. There were about a dozen loud and heavy knocks that should have woken everyone on that floor because the walls were so thin. Beside our door was a frosted glass panel and I saw a silhouette, someone crouching there. It did not register to me as odd at the time. I approached, placed my right hand on the locked doorknob, and asked, Who is it? A woman started speaking in rapid, excited Thai, but the strange thing was that the sound was not coming from behind the door. It was coming from behind me, above me, from my left and right, and everywhere at once. After about three sentences, she stopped, and the silhouette vanished. It was the kind of dormitory corridor where all footsteps echoed, but this time, I did not hear anyone walking away. I was rooted to the spot, afraid to turn around, but afraid of lingering near the door as well. Somehow, I knew that what spoke to me was not human, or was no longer human, and I always assumed that if this ever happened, I would fall to the floor in a dead faint. But I didn't. I turned around and went back to bed. I didn't speak Thai, I wasn't sure if that made the situation better or worse. I thought of waking Vidya up, but 
I was also afraid of looking silly. I don't know how I did it, but I managed to fall asleep. I woke up before Widya did the next morning, which was a miracle because she usually woke up first for her morning prayers. She was surprised to see me sitting up, and my facial expression must have told her that something wasn't quite right. I told her what happened. After giving me a very nervous look, she assumed her position on her mat facing the east and started praying. I woke up the other girls on the floor, gathered them in the corridor, and told them the same story. I remember that the other girls from the Philippines were spooked, as was Bupa, the only girl from Cambodia. The Vietnamese were a little calmer about it. The eldest girl, Dao from Laos, was visiting her sister who lived near Chula Lankon, which was unfortunate because she seemed like the type who would have her wits about her at a time like this. She once told us that her home was haunted by spirits who shook her bed at night. The boys in the program didn't comment much, although one suggested placing a Buddha image in our room. Tavin from Laos taught me how to properly pay my respects to the Buddha image at the entrance of the dormitory with the full Buddhist bow, which I have since perfected. After dinner, Widya went to our room to attend her evening prayers and thesis, while I stayed in the lobby with the others. About an hour later, she appeared in a blaze of panic. Anna! 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 She ran right into me and I hugged her, asking, What happened? What's going on? She said that she had fallen asleep, but she woke up because someone was whispering in her ear in rapid Thai, and she saw a long lock of white hair across her chest. She said that she couldn't move at first, but when the whispering stopped, she was able to get up and run downstairs. Predictably, we were very alarmed at this point. I was raised Catholic, but I wasn't practicing anymore. The others who were tried to rebuke the spirit. Tavin, who could understand Thai, started talking to the few Thai students who were also in the lobby. The strange things was that none of them were surprised. They told me, in English, that if the woman had white hair and was visiting us, then she was the building spirit guard, or Chao Ti. They said that they've all seen her before at one point or another. They also called my attention to strips of colorful cloth tied around a beam of wood at the opposite restaurant, and said that those were for the Chao Ti that lived on that piece of land. I've been seeing those strips of cloth all over Taling Chan, but I've never bothered to ask what they were for. Things were starting to make sense, but I was still wondering why. Of all the occupied rooms on that floor, she was frequenting ours. Did you ask permission to stay? A Thai student asked. What? What permission? I said. Permission from the Chao Ti. We always ask permission before staying. I felt ashamed for not knowing this, and I was so sorry for being disrespectful of the spirits. It turned out that, for all the other rooms, at least one of them had asked for permission to stay. It just so happened that they placed one Filipino and one Indonesian who didn't know about the practice in the same room. The others knew about it because they grew up in Buddhist societies where this was common. The Thai students assured us that she meant no harm. If anything, she was trying to welcome us. Widya and I mustered all our courage, marked right back up to our room, and asked the Chauti to grant us permission to stay. We spoke in our native language, hoping that the sentiments will somehow transcend the language barrier. When I was 19, I traveled across Thailand. Up river from the tourist trap of Krabi, I wound toward the steaming Khao Panum. It was in this virgin rainforest I planned to acquaint myself with the objects of my future studies. I planned then to pursue ecology. Dragonflies with leathery wings teemed in the atmosphere of the river surface. Among seaweed and flotsam were the faded Coca-Cola logs and used condoms trickling in from the expanding settlements. On the 18th day, I was wandering a sandbank littered with swollen mangrove pods when I came across an American film crew. They were piling into an onshore hut with a domed roof unlike any of the others I'd seen. I approached the hut assuredly, merging with this crowd. A gleaming SUV, unlikely to belong to any among the native community, was parked outside. 
On its steel flanks, it wore the logo, In the Wake of the Unknown. The hut seemed to serve as a medical tent of kinds. Inside, the cabinetmen were pressed tight around a swelling throng of backs. Arching over the sweating white bodies were the microphone cranes, examining an unseen subject at center. I identified a sharp-dressed woman at front as one of the show hosts. She kept making hushed remarks to the nearest lens. The male host, somewhere nearer the subject, kept repeating the words, He says the pain is getting worse, but all I can do is watch. I pushed through at last. A primitive stock table had been erected, and stretched over it was an undressed Thai man. He was retching, pulling his lips back and moaning, showing all signs of spasmodic agony. His wet chokes were steadily interpreted by a translator who fed them to a typist. A squatting man sporting binoculars on his tanned, blonde-haired chest kept repeating, in different tones of voice, The pain is only increasing for this poor man. The Thai man looked to be in his fifties, though he wore his years worse than most. Every patch of skin on his bony frame seemed bound too tight and threatened to tear with his contortions. The first host lifted a small hand for a moment's reprieve. She delicately lifted a lock of golden hair from her brow, tucking it behind one ear before resuming commentary. I noticed blood was oozing from the Thai man's lips. He had scraped much of the gum away from his front teeth on the lower jaw. He continued to dig into the slippery wounds like an itch. He began to make a high-pitched whining. At first, it was like the noise of a crying dog or a kicked rabbit. But it rose and burst with each beat, causing the host to shut up and the cameramen to grip their instruments two-handed and drop their mugs. It rose to the sound of a siren screaming when his chest collapsed inward and the wound belched a column of rancid black smoke. The few natives present screamed and peeled off at once, but the film crew, coughing in the smoke, remained in silence. The old man too had ceased his shriek and now blubbered, perhaps choking on his own blood and scattered gum flesh. In a flash, billowing smoke forms were blurrily illuminated by a trickling red light on the crushed chest. The weird angles of the inverted ribcage were cast in high definition in the light of a small fire couched in the man's still bubbling lungs. As though his blood were oil, the flames licked up and down his torso and started eating themselves and engorging rapidly. Spirals of fat orange flame teased the hanging mics. The man was shaking like an infant with its leg broken, weeping for his mother in a foreign tongue. The fire showed no interest in his pain, and following some unseen geometry, spread along his body like a sigil, sizzling the skin off the flesh till globules spat on the floor in the insect-like death throes of melting plastic. The throat's crown gave in, and the flesh and tongue of the lower jaw bubbled over the edges of the table, allowing a clear passage into the man's face. With flames creeping under his skin and rising in fat ripe boils at the eyelid, the final expression this man's eyes were a childlike look of absolute fear. They grew for a moment, then burst and dribbled out the sockets like candle wax. It was hard to tell if he was alive. His movements had long since ceased, but with the destruction of the face, the film crew began to talk excitedly amongst each other again loud enough to be heard over the crackling fire. Eventually, the smell became too much and we were calmly evacuated by the show hosts. The entire hut was burned to the ground after a long hot day spent breaching the perfect blue sky with thick black clouds. I reclined on the sand grass and watched as the microphones were levered into the rising tendrils of smoke, capturing crisp audio of the embers burning out. The hosts appeared to be crying on the camera. One of them pushed the other away and put a hand over the camera. They repeated this stylized action seven times, sometimes switching roles. A native girl sat near me and eyed me at a distance. Her Betty Boop sweater, sleeves torn off, ragged and neckline slashed deeply, 
happened to be the same faded pink of the iguana that shuffled between us towards the water. He killed a witch's daughter, she announced, almost offhandedly as if the subject's smoldering remains were not just a few feet away from us. And in her fury, she cast an old sort of curse on him that he would die in this fashion. But he seemed to be an old man, I said, placing a hand to my brow to see her better. He looked in no condition to harm a fly. This is a very old kind of spell. He was cursed thirty years ago, and has lived those years knowing what would happen on this precise day. In these years he turned to God, praying and praying, and had gone mad from praying until he became the wretched thing you saw today. I nodded slowly, examining the soft slope of her upper thigh where it dipped into the sand. We moved closer and watched as the film crew dispersed and the embers cleared and the dust colors fell upon the unquiet canopy. A few days ago, I was on a biology trip in Chiang Mai, Thailand. I won't bother you with the details because it was pretty boring. But every night, the hotel we were staying at would provide us with activities that we could choose whether we wanted to do or not. One of them was night games, and this one I want to focus on. It was dark, almost pitch black. We weren't in a large city, so there wasn't any light from buildings or streets. This was pure natural darkness. After explaining us the safety rules, the instructors led us down a dirt path and through a field to a large cluster of trees. It was here that we were to be playing our night games. Our objective was to get from one gazebo to another gazebo on the other side of the trees without getting caught by the instructors. They would catch us by shining a torchlight on us. It was a stealth game. We had to be quiet and good at hiding behind the trees in the shadow of them. So the game started. We all moved quietly out of the gazebo and into the trees, hiding in the shadows. I decided to go for the darkest route along the edge. Little did I know that there would be someone, or something, waiting there for me. About ten minutes had passed and most of us had reached the other gazebo, but not me. All was quiet now. I may have been the only one left. It was hard to tell. We were playing the game well now. As I walked, I watched around for the instructor's lights. I was standing behind a tree when I heard a crack from a tree in front of me. I squinted at that area for one of my classmates. I couldn't see one, but I assumed that they were on the other side of the tree, out of my view. I went back to watching for the instructors. I stepped out from behind a tree and proceeded to walk towards the tree where I heard the crack. As I did so, something caused me to stop. I don't know what it was, but as I looked towards the tree I was aiming for, I heard another crack, then another, a little closer. Then I glanced at the floor near the tree and noticed it was moving as though somebody was walking towards me. I was frozen in fear as I watched an unseen body kick leaves and grass up as though somebody with big feet was briskly walking through the leaf litter getting ever closer to me. Then about one meter in front of me, it stopped. Jesus, I gasped. My heart was thumping against my chest, adrenaline sharpening my vision. Of course, my first instinct was that the instructors were playing a prank on me, but then as I looked around, I saw torches flash in the other areas of the trees, nowhere near to where I was. Dazed but still determined, I carried on with the game and reached the gazebo. However, later on, as I was talking to the instructors, they had found that on several occasions, they had seen the shape of people in the trees, only to shine the torch on the area and find nothing there. And most of these occurrences happening was where I had experienced the footsteps. I will tell you about a few peculiar things that happened to me about a year ago. My friend and I, Maria, decided to move in together as both of our earlier leases were just about to expire and we spent pretty much every waking hour together either way. We went house hunting 
and finally found an apartment that we both really saw some potential for. It was rather cheap and absolutely massive. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, living room, and a big balcony. I had spent the last few months living in a tiny studio without a kitchen, and it was really a relief to find this place, especially considering that I had a kitten that grew bigger and bigger each day. The building itself was pretty worn out, built in a depressive old Chinese style with low, heavy roof and dirty gray, once white walls, and generally loads of concrete. The elevators were especially unpredictable and made me feel claustrophobic. The lights would go out and it would take you to random floors and once even got stuck between the floors with us trapped in it. But the apartment itself was newly renovated and it felt like it just needed a little bit of light and care to become homey and welcoming. It would be our oasis in the middle of busy Bangkok. The weekend we moved in was pretty rough on us. We had so much stuff and no time to move at all. Work had us staying late every night and forced us into moving little by little long after midnight. Because of this, the relief was even greater when we finally had cleaned and prepared the place perfectly. I took a deep breath and thought, wow, finally all done. At this very same second, I heard a loud banging sound coming from my room. We ran in and saw my brand new clothing rack all bent and broken, and clothes were covering the entire floor, as if someone in rage had bent it and tossed away all my clothes. The thing was pretty solid and brand new. Maria had the exact same model that we bought at the same time, and this one never broke. But the most unsettling thing was that feeling of it not being just a normal fall. I finally had just finished cleaning, and the clothes pretty much had exploded all over the rather big room. It just didn't feel natural. After this, we both stayed together in Maria's room, even though we had all this extra space. I wasn't scared or anything, but it just naturally turned out that way as we would always watch movies there before bed. It was the easiest room to cool down, and we both wanted to sleep with the kitten. Although there was something in the atmosphere in the apartment that wasn't quite right, it felt impossible to keep the place bright, no matter how much sun you let in the windows or how many lamps were lit. The kitten seemed scared sometimes and other times acted like she was hiding or running away from something. She even ignored her litter box once in a while. This was not a normal behavior for her before. A few times, we had visitors and this seemed to encourage a spike in odd happenings. Visitors would stay in my room, in which I actually never spent a single night, and this really seemed to trigger something. However, there was this one event that was just standing out. It was impossible to ignore or brush off as nothing. We were just about to sleep. In the big bed, we were laying apart from each other with our backs facing each other. Stretched out between us was a thin blanket. Suddenly, we clearly feel and hear something stomping up the bed, starting from the bottom and walking angrily all the way up to our heads. The blanket got pushed down between us as the mattress itself was clearly sinking in from each step. There was no one else in the room, not even the kitten, as we had closed the bedroom door not to disturb visiting parents. We were frightened, of course, but also amazed that something like that actually just happened. We ended up leaving the apartment after staying there for only about three months because of other reasons not related to our haunting. But I still look up at it sometimes when I pass by it on my way home late from work. I wonder if anyone will ever feel welcomed in that apartment.